Hi, we are meeting up with the first webinar of strategic business reporting subject. I made a mistake, ABR, advanced business reporting subject. And as you know, this particular subject is a combination of two elements. Partly there is financial reporting and partly there is auditing. And the contribution from the financial reporting is from 65 percent and the contribution from auditing part is 35 percent. And the paper structure, uh, right before the exam, you get a mini case study which we call it pre-seen. And at the exam we get the unseen. The questions that are there in the paper, unseen paper, are connected to the mini case study which we studied right before the exam. Your paper is comprising of only three questions and there are two section, sections altogether, section A and the section B. Section A has two questions only and those two questions are not connected to the mini case study. You need not to be thorough, you need not to go through the case study to answer the first two questions. And the case study or the pre scene is connected only to the third question. The first two question carry 25 marks each and the last question, third question carries 50 marks all together. Now, this is an open closed bo book exam. What does it mean? For financial reporting, you can make use of the, the required materials, the basically the standard book and there are some more. But for the auditing part, I think the auditing lecturer would have explained that part. For the auditing, I think the exam is not open book, it is closed book. Being the examination open book does not mean that you can straight away copy the answers from the standard book. That is not the expectation. And the accounting prescriptions given in the standard can be used to build up your answer without just copying the entire standard accounting treatments into your answer script. And remember your answer should be designed in a way that they match to the expectations of the examiner and also you need to design your answers in a way that it will suit to the action verbs in the paper. Disregarding the action verbs, disregarding the expectations of the exam, if you start copying everything from the standard book, I do not think you will get marks. So, as a result, you have to get me right. Not that this is my personal opinion or view, and this is the views of the examiners. You are at the final stage and you are at the verge of being a chartered accountant. So, just copying the answers from the standard book will never serve your purpose. You have to make use of the standard book to build and develop your answers at the exam hall. And as you can see for yourself, the topic that we are starting with is financial instrument. And we know for financial instruments, we have three standards, SLFR is 9, SLFR is 7, LK is 32. But I will not discuss LK is 32 now because we have done it at previous stage corporate level or the previous business level. And if somebody wants to brush up the knowledge of LK 32, you can watch the webinars of the corporate level CL2. Also, I am not starting SLFR is 9 from the very beginning. I will not discuss the classification of assets and liabilities. I will not discuss initial measurement, subsequent measurement. I will not discuss the accounting for transaction cost and so Cost, uh, cost and so on and so forth. Why? Those are the areas which we learned at corporate level, previous level. So, if you want to brush them up, you might as well to watch the webinars of corporate level and then start watching the videos hereafter. Then, you know, uh, let me take this point at the starting point, as I said before. You know, certain, there are certain instances where financial liabilities are 
designated under fair value option. What it says is financial liabilities that would have been otherwise classified under other financial liabilities may be classified under fair value through profit and loss to eliminate accounting mismatch. Or in short, if you decide to classify a financial liability under fair value debt instrument under fair value through profit and loss and that fair value change cannot be taken to profit and loss by the full amount and that fair value loss has to be bifurcated has to be taken into two components fair value changes due to market changes market condition changes and the fair value changes due to the changes of the credit risk so i promised to work out a small example on that so let me take that as the starting point and then let's see how best we can go forward so what i said was let me take the same example I took before. You are familiar with this example now. APLC purchases a building at 5 million rupees and this was rented. And this becomes investment properties under LKS 40. And the entity decides to apply fair value model for investment property for the subsequent measurement. Under fair value model what happens is the asset is recognized initially at the cost and the subsequent measurement should be fair value. Fair value changes are recognized to profit and there is no depreciation and that entire fair value model has all those characteristics. How did this entity finance the purchase of the building and they issued a 5 year bond with a face value of 5 million rupees. And since it is not for trading purpose, this is not a derivative. If you stick to the technical classifications and this debt instrument bond has to be classified under other financial liability category. Then it is initially measured at fair value subsequent amortized cost and in order to calculate the amortized cost you need to have the effective interest rate. As I said before these two items are interconnected. If not for the building, we would never go for the bond issue. If not for the bond issue, we would never be able to finance the purchase of the building. Since those two are interconnected to each other, interdependent on each other, SLFRS 9 does not require any other accounting to be used to the bond. Whatever the accounting we are going to adopt for the accounting of the bond should be consistent with that of the investment properties. For the accounting for the bond to be similar and compatible and consistent with the accounting of the investment properties, even this bond has to be subsequently measured at fair value where the fair value changes are recognized to profit and loss and no depreciation. And for those features to be taken here for the accounting, whether you like or not, you need to forcibly put it under which category fair value through profit and loss. And then only the items are interconnected and then we apply same and similar consistent methods of accounting for either items and then accounting mismatch can there is no accounting mismatch. So, there is a consistency of accounting if you po forcibly put it under fair value option, I mean fair value through profit and loss. Then subsequent fair value, initially 
fair value say 5 million, subsequent fair value say 4.6 million and this fair value change 400,000 cannot be dumped into profit and loss indiscriminately. Instead, what you must do is to split the fair value change into two, the fair value changes due to market condition changes and the fair value changes due to risk factor, credit risk of the entity issuer and the fair value changes due to the changes of the credit risk should be recognized to OCI and the fair value changes due to market condition changes should be recognized to profit and loss. Let us do a comprehensive example on that and then we will move forward. split the fair value change into the fair value change attributed to credit risk and the amount of fair value changes due to the changes in the market conditions we can make use of the formula. Amount of change in fair value attributed to credit risk is equal to total amount of change in fair value minus amount of change in fair value attributed to market risk. Having that been taken down, let us go to a simple calculation.
on 1st January 16, an entity issued a 5 year bond with a face value of 200,000 rupees. Coupon rate is 7 percent per annum. Coupon rate reflects the market's LIBOR rate and the credit spread associated with the bond at the time of the issue. SLIBO was 5 percent at the time of the issue. SLIBO is 5.25 percent on 31 December 16. The yield to maturity has now risen to 7.5. Credit spread is 2.25. Explain the accounting part of it. Now, issuing a bond is simply like we take in a loan to repay that in 5 years time. This is not for trading purpose, this is not a derivative either. So, if you apply technically the classification criteria of SLFR is 9, you need to put it under the financial liabilities. But we will decide to designate it under fair value option and then you need to recognize it initially at fair value, subsequently fair value and changes are recognized to profit and loss. Now, here when you take a loan, you need to pay interest and what is this interest rate comprising with? You know, interest rate is basically comprising of two elements, time value of money plus the credit risk. Time value of money has to show the market assessment uh, that has to be a time value of money plus the credit risk and the time value of money is represented by SLIBO rate. Other than the time value of money, whoever who gives us money is expecting something, expecting another higher return for the risks that they take over. And we are not like the banker that there is no, I mean, uh, that, that is not a risk free investment for the lenders, there is a risk involved. So, for the risk that they have taken over, they are expecting a kind of a higher return in excess in addition to the market return. So, that is what this credit risk has been assessed for and that is going to be how much? It is going to be 2 percent at the beginning. Why? We decided to pay 7 percent interest rate. What is it comprising with SLIBO 5 percent and the balance 2 percent would have been for the credit risk of the entity. So, they are expecting 2 percent more for the risk they have taken over. Then, end of the first year, SLIBO rate has changed from 5 percent to 5.25 percent. In other words, market conditions have changed and that is denoted from the SLIBO rate being different at the end of the year to 5.25 from 5 percent. And not only has the market conditions, not only have the market conditions changed, also the credit risk of the entity has risen. Credit quality of the entity has deteriorated. Why? At the beginning of the year, lenders were expecting only 2 percent for the risk they take over, but towards the end of the year, whoever who is lending you money will be expecting 0.25 percent extra for the risk they are going to take over. So, higher the risk, the higher the return that the lenders are expecting. Now, you know for you to value the fair value of this debt instrument on the reporting date that is part of SLFR is 13, but can't tell we need to apply and that part may not be clear, it is not because you do not understand financial instrument, that is because you have not done SLFR is 13 yet, nothing to worry. For you to calculate the fair value on the report in date of the first year, you need to derive the future cash flows of the instrument over the rest of the 4 years period and to discount those future cash flows by the new interest rate, the new interest rate should be how much? towards the end of the year 5.25 revised LIBO plus 2.25 revised credit risk and that will be 7.5. And if you start discounting the future cash loss by that revised total rate of 7.5, 
finally the ultimate fair value that you get is the fair value with both changes of market condition changes and changes of the credit risk as well and that fair value change cannot be fully taken to profit and loss that has to be broken down so let me first calculate the fair value total fair value end of the first year fair value of the bond the cash flows are 200,000 face value into 7 percent should be the coupon 14,000 we are now at the end of the first year so we will take the future cash flows second year 14,000 third year 14,000 fourth year 14,000 last year 214,000 discounted by 1.075 1.075 to the power 2, 1.075 to the power 3, 1.075 to the power 4. So, the answer will be 196.651. So, initial fair value would have been 200,000. Now, it is 196,651. So, the fair value change is going to be like 3,341, 3,341 fair value change is including the fair value changes resulted by the resulted by the changes of market conditions also resulted by the changes in the credit quality of the entity. Now you need to break that into two fair value changes due to market conditions and fair value changes due to credit quality then you need to do a repeat the same calculation let me take the same cash loss 14,000 here 14,000 14,000 plus 214,000 and then what you will what, what will you do right so, you want to find out the changes in fair value attributed to market risk, attributed to market risk. If you want to find out the fair value change due to market risk, market conditions, the credit risk has to be assumed to be constant. Now, we are at the end of the first year. At the beginning of the year, at the point of the issue, credit risk was estimated to be 2 percent. And this credit risk is assumed to have been constant over the period and then that is assumed to be still 2 percent. 2 percent plus changes in market conditions 5.25. Then I will take the rate only as 7.25. 7.25 rate includes only the market condition changes and it does not include the credit risk changes. Then I will rediscount my same cash loss by 1.0725. 1.0725 1.0725 this is to the power 2 power 3 power 4 then i will get the fair value change 198316 now let me do the split total fair value change Total fair value change 200,000 minus 1963651. That is 3,349 minus fair value change 
on market risk or market conditions. 200,000 minus 198,316. That is 1684. Then the difference has to be 1665. Then fair value changes. Due to credit risk. So, if you open up a simple T account for the accounting part of it, bond liability, open imbalance 200,000. Here, <coughs> The interest can be recognized 14,000 effective interest and coupon has to be paid in cash. So, the closing balance has to be 196651 closing balance. And the change has to be in the debit side, 3,341. Of this change, 1665 goes to OCI, one thousand six eighty four should go to profit and loss. So, that is how it is done. Now, we can go forward. So, we look at question number 18 here. APLC invested in the bond of a company with a face value of 600,000 rupees and coupon interest rate is 10 percent. The coupon is re received annually in areas the transaction cost is 60,000. This is to be matured in 4 years time at 680,000 rupees the fair value of the bond at the end of each year over 4 years maturity period are 615,000, 640,000, 675 and 730,000 respectively. Right. You need to show the accounting if the entity decides to categorize it under fair value through OCI or if the entity decides to categorize it under amortized cost. Now, before that I must tell you something. We talk about two kinds of interest recognition, they are coupon interest and the effective interest. Coupon interest has to be the interest that applies always on the face value, but effective interest is different. 
this coupon interest and the effective interest will be sim similar and will be a sim single or rather will be a similar figure provided there is no transaction cost, no transaction cost. There are no discounts at the time of the investment, no discounts and there are no premiums at the redemption. What I am saying is this, if you acquire a bond at 500,000 rupees face value and if you get only 10 percent coupon at the mature, just say the maturity is just one year's time, you get only 550,000 rupees at the maturity. Nothing does the investor ever get other than the investor receiving 10 percent coupon. The only income that the investor gets is the coupon rate of 10 percent. So, your total income which is effective interest is equal to coupon. But say, <coughs> At the time of the investment, the investor paid only 450,000 rupees for a bond which has a face value is face value of 500,000. And though you invested only 450,000 rupees, it does not mean that coupon rate applies on the value you invested. Coupon rate applies always on the face value. And your interest still will be how much? 50,000. <clears throat> at the maturity which is in one year's time, you can receive back 500,000. So, apart from you receiving 50,000 interest which we call coupon, you are to receive 50,000 extra, what is it? You paid only 450,000, you are to receive 500,000 rupees. So, you will get 50,000 rupees extra apart from you receiving 10 percent coupon. So, then your total income should be discount at the point of the investment plus coupon altogether 100,000. Now, effective interest should be 100,000 whereas, the coupon rate should be 10 percent. Now, coupon rate and the effective rate will not be similar because there was a discount at the point of the investment. Then, <coughs> let me take the same scenario where you invested only 450,000 of a bond whose fail face value was 500,000 and the coupon rate is 10 total income effectively should be 100,000, but there was a transaction cost of 20,000. Then your total income should not be 100,000 rupees, your total income should be 80,000. So, you should calculate your effective rate to recognize this 80,000 rupees in such a way the transaction cost also gets included. Now, if you further simplify, you acquire a bond whose face value is 500,000 rupees, coupon rate is 10 percent. So, you should get 515 one year's time. But at the point of the investment, you had to incur a transaction cost of 10,000. So, effectively, your investment is not just 500,000, should be 510 then effectively your income is not 50,000 rupees, your income should be 40,000. So, coupon, inter, coupon rate is 10 percent, but your effective interest will not be 10 percent, will be 8 percent. So, what makes the effective interest rate different from the coupon rate? They are transaction cost. Then, <coughs> You acquire a bond with a face value of 500,000, coupon rate is 10 percent, maturity value should be 550. And at the time of the investment, you get to know that face value is 500,000, but redemption value is 530,000. 
So, you will get another premium at the point of the redemption. So, apart from you receiving 10 percent coupon interest, you also will be entitled to another payment of 30,000 and altogether your income will be 80,000. Coupon is coupon is 10 percent that is 50,000 rupee interest, but your total income will be 80,000 divided by 500,000 into 100 percent will give you effective rate. So, what makes the effective interest rate different from the coupon rate they are the premium at the point of the redemption. So, remember your coupon interest and the effective interest rate will be equal similar where there is no transaction cost at the point of the issue, where there are no discounts at the point of the investment, where there are no premiums at the point of the redemption. And if those items are not available, not attached to an instrument, simply your effective and the coupon rates will be similar and then the coupon interest itself is the amount of interest to be recognized your profit and loss. Remember your interest income to be taken to profit and loss should be always based on effective not on coupon. But where the coupon and the effective rates are similar, your profit and loss item which is effective interest should be similar to coupon. So, having that in your mind, we will go to question number 18. <clears throat> now, face value is 600,000, coupon is 10 percent, four years maturity, at the maturity redemption value, redeemable value is 680,000 rupees, there is a premium of 60,000, premium 80,000 premium, I made a mistake, 80,000 premium and <coughs> there is a transaction cost of 60,000, transaction cost of 60,000. Then your coupon income, coupon 10 percent on face value, 60,000 rupees a year into 4 years time, 240. Annually every year you will go on receiving 60,000 rupees over 4 years time, the bulk is 240 apart from you receiving 240, also you will receive a premium at the redemption, then your total income would have been 320, but there, since there is a transaction cost at the point of the investment, you need to reduce it by 60,000, then your total income is 260,000. Since there is transaction cost, since there is premium, the coupon rate and the effective rate will be different. So, for you to recognize income to the profit and loss, you need to find out the effective rate and your income to the profit and loss is not just the coupon over 4 years time that is wrong, your total income over 4 years time should be 260,000. To slice that 260,000 to cut and chop over 4 years time, that 260,000 you need to calculate the effective rate which is equal to IRR. So, let us do it first. <coughs> Year 0, first year in, second year in, third year in and the fourth year in. Cash outflow 600,000 rupees and the transaction cost of 60,000, cash outflow. Cash inflow 60,000, cash inflow 60,000, cash inflow 60,000, fourth year in total cash inflow should be 740,000. How does it come? 
This is 600,000 face value, coupon of 60, premium of another 80,000, total 740. Now, we will bring those figures into the formula of IRR. 60,000 divided by 1 plus R, 60,000 divided by 1 plus R to the power 2, 60,000 divided by 1 plus R to the power 3, 740,000 divided by 1 plus R to the power 4, minus 660,000 is equal to 0. If you simplify the formula either using the calculator using Excel, the rate is 9.746,000. And that is defective interest rate. Now, the examiner requires us to show the accounting. If the entity decides to classify the debt instrument or the investment in the debt instrument under fair value through OCI and under amortized cost. So, let me do both of them together. <coughs> Amortized cost fair value through OCI in either methods the initial measurement should be the fair value six hundred thousand six hundred thousand. And transaction cost under each method, transaction cost should be added to the initial carrying value that is 60,000. Transaction cost 60,000. Then you apply effective interest rate on 660,000 to calculate the amount of interest income to the first year, interest income that goes to profit and loss. So, you can recall your memories, the interest income you recognize to profit and loss should be effective interest rate. So, that is 64,325, 64,325 and interim cash payments are there, debit cash and credit to asset account 60,000. So, can you recall the formula for amortized cost? Initial fair value plus amortized finance income minus the repayments will be equal to amortized cost. So, if you close up the account, <coughs> 7 Balance is 615,000. This is the amortized cost and this is what appears in the balance sheet. We will apply here interest, profit and loss 64,325 and we are receiving the coupon in cash 60,000 debit cash and credit to investment account. Right now, what makes you recognize the investment and the amortized cost? Because that passes SPPI test, solely the payment of principles and interest. Our intention is not to collect the sales proceeds, to collect only the principal and interest. So, you need to show how initial fair value gets transformed to the maturity value and the amortized cost. So, what makes you recognize the investment under fair value through OCI? Because you have an intention of collecting both contractual cash flows and sales proceeds. So, it has to be a combination of both. Now, if you balance this account and put the value, again you get 615,000 which is the amortized cost. 
that is not what we are going to show in the balance sheets. So, what is the value to be shown in the balance sheet now? That is fair value at the end of the year, fair value I made a mistake here, the seven to twenty four, <coughs> three to twenty five, seven to twenty four, three to twenty five, amortized cost is six hundred and sixty four, three to twenty five and that is the amortized cost please. Here you cannot put the amortized cost, instead you need to put the fair value, fair value is 615,000 and this is what goes to the balance sheet. <coughs> then we will balance the account, 7 to 24, 3 to 25, 7 to 24, 3 to 25, so, there is a balance in figure, balance in figure is 49,325 and that should go to OCI. Then the second year, this is <coughs> 664,325 under amortized cost, we will recognize second year interest 64,747 that is at the effective interest rate on 664,325. The entity will receive coupon interest 60,000 debit cash and credit to investment account. Then the balance 729,072, 729,072 balance 669,072. That is the amortized cost. If it was under fair value through OCI, opening balance is now 615. Recognize interest not on 615, you need to recognize interest on the amortized cost. This is like a combination of both amortized cost and fair value. So, then 64,747 should be interest. We are receiving the coupon interest 60,000 debit cash and credit to asset account and the closing balance is not amortized cost closing balance has to be 640,000 fair value. Close up the account to find out fair value changes and that should be taken to OCI 700,000, 700,000 balance in figure is what has to be taken to OCI 20,253. At the beginning of the third year, amortized cost is 669072. <coughs> interest to the first, uh, third year, third year interest is 65,210. We are receiving the cash in the third year, 60,000. Close up the account to calculate the amortized cost. Amortized cost is 674,282, 734,282, 734,282. Fair value through OCI, open imbalance 640,000. We will recognize interest, effective interest 65,210. We are receiving the coupon for the third year 60,000. The close imbalance is no longer the amortized cost. The close imbalance has to be the fair value. Fair value is 675, 675. 
close up the account and then you will find out fair value changes to be recognized to OCI 735. 735 balance in figure 0 this is 9 7 9 29,790. Last year we will recognize interest at effective rate. So that is 65,718. We are receiving the coupon interest 60,000. And we will calculate the amortized cost 680,000. And fair value through OCI will recognize interest 65,718. We are receiving the coupon 60,000. Closing balance is no longer the amortized cost that is the fair value. Fair value is 730,000. Do not worry about this fair value. And we will take the changes in fair value and that is taken to OCI. Fair value change is 49,282. That goes to OCI. Sometimes at strategic level, a question of this nature can be coupled with SLFRS 13 and a similar question has been given in June 2015. What happens is here, APLC invested in the bond of a company with a face value of 800,000 and coupon rate is 12. Coupon is received annually in areas. Transaction cost is 40. Maturity value is 880,000 in 3 years time. The yield curve of the bond is 12%, 15 at the end of the first year and the second year respectively. You are required to prepare the investment account if the entity is recognized in that under fair value through OCI and it is recognized under amortized cost. There, fair values are not given like the questions we just finished discussing. You need to apply SLFRS 13 first to calculate fair values of the instrument using the yield curve and then only you can do the other calculation. You can try on that on and see how successfully you can complete. So, we can move on in our discussion. Derecognition of financial assets, this is also another important area why I have seen lot of examples being given in the papers. If you see 2016 June, uh, questions have been given from derecognition, it is not uh, ABR that it was CFR, 
your equivalent paper and there is a lengthy and a heavy flow chart being given in my presentation also in the standard book to explain the derecognition criteria and we can't discuss all of them with all the examples in the presentations that takes lot of time. So, instead of making that so detailed, let me concisely bring all these criteria of derecognitions under four headings. Financial assets are derecognized, derecognized when the risks and rewards incident to the ownership pass to another party. <clears throat> we also derecognize financial assets when the control of the financial asset passes to another party. Third, also we derecognize financial assets when liabilities, liabilities occur on financial assets. Fourth one, we also derecognize financial assets when the financial assets ceases, stops generating cash flows to the entity, cash flows to the entity. Now, for each and every criteria, a bulk of examples can be given, but we cannot discuss all that entire bulky list of examples with in this video. We have to be within the time frame. So, let me start with the simplest and the easiest available. That was the last one. There is no order to follow. And there are a lot of instances where a financial asset stops generating cash flows to a business. The moment you can satisfy yourself that this financial asset no longer makes money to the business, you need to remove it from the books. That is what you mean by derecognition. The moment the asset stops making cash flows to the business any longer, without you continuing to show the asset in the books, you need to pull it out from the books to remove it from the books and that is what you mean by derecognition. And just to support your understanding with a simple example, this is the simplest example that anybody can ever give for this. Say we have debtors, <coughs> trade receivables. So, that is 5 million. <coughs> What has happened is we get to know that the customer who owes us money is no longer capable of making the settlement to us and he is already dead or maybe bankrupt. And however much you try to convince him to pay us that nothing works out. So, finally, we came to the conclusion, compromising conclusion that this asset does not generate as a cash flow. No longer can we expect this asset to generate cash flows into the business. 
then you decide to de recognize credit to asset and debit to profit and loss a de recognition fourth criteria when the asset stops generating cash flows into the business let me move on to the first one which is the hardest part also the most important part an entity can derecognize a financial asset where the particular financial asset concern is sold to another party and along with the sale transaction the entity transfers risks and rewards of the asset to the buyer so you know a sale transaction can be viewed in two different uh, perceptions you can look at it from the accounting viewpoint also you can look at it from the legal viewpoint just by transferring the legal title of the asset to the buyer the sale transaction is considered to have been completed legally but that's not how we look at it from the accounting viewpoint for a sale to be a genuine absolute commercial sale transaction we should not only transfer the legal title also you should transfer the risks and rewards to the buyer risks and rewards to the buyer now <clears throat> say there are a lot of instances where a sale is considered to be a sale legally because the legal title has passed to the buyer but that same sale transaction is not considered to be a genuine commercial sale transactions in accounting language why risks and rewards have not been transferred to the buyer and let it to be a sale from the legal viewpoint and we are not bothered so we are bothered only when the sale transaction occurs from the accounting viewpoint for the sale transaction to be a genuine complete sale transaction let the risks and rewards be transferred from the seller to the buyer if saman mali gets married to saman saman mali's name will be changed from her father's surname to husband's surname legal title passes from the parents to the buyer husband that is only a legal marriage but for there to be a marriage in our accounting jargon all the risks and rewards need to be transferred from the parents to the buyer husband even after the marriage saman mali is dropped to the office by father not by the husband saman mali is picked from the office in the evening not by the husband but by the father even after getting the salary salary is given not to the husband to the parents even for a slight headache she has to be taken to the hospital not by the husband but by the father irrespective of the legal marriage still all the risks and rewards of the product saman mali still are with the seller parents and though it is a legal marriage there is no marriage in substance why the seller has not transferred risks and rewards for us people like y'all and this is a hell of a different kind of a marriage why husband is separate still the parents will get involved with all the activities of the product so so similarly we can apply the same concept here as well now let me take couple of examples there is a quite quite a lot but we can discuss all of them here let me take only the most important areas of de recognition under first category where risks and rewards incident to the ownership pass to another party <clears throat> 
pre-purchase agreements and securities lending. Seller A. So, they have a financial asset in their books at 5 million rupees. Say on 1st January 19, a sells, a sells the financial asset at 6 million rupees. At the same time, they enter into repurchase agreement to repurchase the same financial asset in 3 years time at 7.5 million rupees. Why do I call it a sale? I call it a sale transaction from the legal perspective, not from the accounting perspective. For you to call it a sale from the legal perspective, you look at only one aspect. What is it? Whether legal title has passed to the customer or not. Yes, that has passed. But that is not the basis on which we arrive at our conclusions. For you to arrive at our conclusions where the sale is considered to have been a genuine commercial sale transaction. We look at whether the risks and rewards incident to the ownership of the asset have passed to the customer or not. Irrespective of the legal sale transaction, since there is a repurchase agreement to repurchase the asset in three years time, the risks and rewards are not considered to have been transferred to the buyer. I can justify in three years time the seller has to repay 7.5 million rupees to buy it back. Just imagine the market value of the investment falling down to absurd level like 3 million rupees in three years time by the time you repurchase. Even if the market value is expected to be 3 million rupees in 3 years time by the time you repurchase, you have got to pay 7.5 million rupees. So, you pay 7.5 million rupees for an asset which is really worth 3 million. So, the seller is suffering a loss. Conversely, at the time of repurchase in 3 years time, just imagine the market value of the investment skyrocketing to 10 million rupees. Still, you have got to pay only 7.5 million rupees for the investment, which is really worth 10 million rupees in the market. So, from the repurchase transaction, who is benefited? The seller is benefited. So, despite of the fact that the sale has occurred legally, by the time you repurchase, the seller will be exposing himself to massive profits, to massive losses, what does it say? Still the risks and rewards have not been transferred. Then there is no sale. Since risks and rewards have not been transferred, you cannot de-recognize. Why? You de-recognize where the risks and rewards are transferred. Where risks and rewards are not transferred, you cannot de-recognize. If there is no sale, you cannot de-recognize the asset, so let it to be in the books all along. And you cannot recognize profit or loss, why where there is no sale, there is no profit or loss. And the proceeds you received cannot be the sales proceeds, where there is no sale, there cannot be sales proceeds. Then how will you do the accounting? So you need to make it look different. How do you make it look different? by making your thinking different. So, how can you, how can we make our thinking different? It's like this. It's like you giving this asset to someone and taking a loan of 6 million rupees for 3 years time. And in 3 years time, you need to get this asset back and you should repay your loan. At the point of the repayment of the loan, how much are you supposed to pay? 7.5 million rupees. Original loan value has been 6 million. Repayment is 7.5 million rupees. What are you paying additional 1.5 million rupees for? That is the interest for how many years? 3 years time. So then, 
financial asset continues to be recognized in the books and the proceeds you received 6 million rupees should be taken to a loan payable account. And this is another financial liability. Decide the classification. It is not fair value through profit and loss. It has to be under the financial liability. Initial measurement is the fair value. This is considered to be the initial fair value. Subsequently, the measurement should be amortized cost. To calculate the amortized cost, you need the effective interest rate which is not given. So, you can calculate 7.5 million is equal to 6 million rupees into 1 plus r to the power 3. So, you need to find out r. 7.5 divided by 6 million r has to be 7.72. So, if you recognize interest for the first year 6 million into 7.72 percent that is 463,200. 6 million 463,200 should be the amortized cost and you know amortized cost serves two purposes bringing the initial fair value to the maturity value and amortizing the finance cost logically over the maturity period. So, that is how you do the accounting when you sell a financial asset with a repurchase agreement and a securities lending here, you have obtained a loan of 6 million rupees by providing the financial asset as a security and that was the sole purpose. Sale of a financial asset with a call option and previous did we study a sale with a repurchase agreement. If you have a repurchase agreement, repurchase of the asset as you agreed is mandatory and you can't change your minds. Later you cannot change not to repurchase why you agreed. So, you need to keep to the promise. But if you sell a financial asset with a call option which the seller can exercise, seller can decide whether he should repurchase it back or not to repurchase and the buyer should keep his mouth shut. He cannot force and influence the seller to buy back, no he cannot do. If the seller decides to buy back, he has to return. If the seller does not decide to buy it back, he has to keep his mouth, mouth shut, he has to keep the asset with him. So, depending on what the seller does, buyer has to respond. Now, if you sell a financial asset with a call option, the seller has the discretion to either to repurchase or not to repurchase. So, right at the beginning, if you sell it on 1st January 19, call option will be valid for say 2 years time, not later, right now, right on the date of the sale, you need to assess how likely the seller is repurchasing or how unlikely the seller is in repurchasing. Say, assets value was 5 million rupees in the books and it was sold at 6 million rupees, sold at 6 million rupees and the seller can repurchase it at 7 million rupees any time over 2 years time. So, the exercise price of the option call option, exercise price of the call option 
should be 7 million. The seller is pretty sure that over 2 years time the market value of the investment will skyrocket that will make the seller feel repurchase the asset he will feel that the market price of the investment will be 9 million rupees over 2 years time. But if he repurchases, he should return only 7 million and that will be worth 9 million rupees. Just imagine you were the seller, what would you do? You will decide to repurchase or decide not to repurchase. You will obviously decide to repurchase. Then the call option is in the money. Seller will repurchase, he wants to get the benefit. Then financial asset is not derecognized. If the market price at the end, I mean at the beginning on the date of the sale is anticipated to be 12 million rupees and the seller is even more likely of repurchasing to get this massive benefit back to him. So, then call option is deep in the money. Financial asset is not derecognized. And just imagine the market price of the investment is anticipated to fall to absurd level like say 5 million rupees over 2 years time after the sale. If the fair value of the market price is expected to be 5 million rupees, it is not worth being repurchased why the seller has to refund 7 million rupees. If you were the seller, what would you do? You would decide to repurchase or decide not to repurchase. Decide not to repurchase, then this call option is out of the money. Then, if the seller does not decide to repurchase, the asset will be with the buyer forever. So, the sale is complete then seller can de-recognize the financial asset. And if the market prices will be falling down to the most absurd levels of market values ever within two years time and that is expected to be 1 million rupees, exercise price should be 7 million repurchase is worth or is not worth, is not worth. So, you all have to be wise without being otherwise. Then, the seller is very much unlikely of repurchasing, call option is deep out of the money and do not de-recognize. And if the market value of the investment is expected to be at 7 million rupees all along, what is the option? It is not kundu money, it has to be at the money. At the money. And this is how you should recognize or de recognize if you sell it with a call option. So, let us look at it. Again, if the sale is done with a put option. Carrying value of the investment. Five million rupees. Selling price. Six million. 
exercise price of the put option 7 million. <coughs> exercise price 7 million. Now, where a put option is there, it is not the seller who can decide whether to repurchase, a, repurchase or not. It is the buyer who can decide whether to return it back to the seller or not to return it back to the seller. So, the upper hand, the decision making power is at the discretion of the buyer. If the buyer decides to return, the seller has no option but to accept. If the buyer decides not to return but to keep it for him and the seller has no right, he cannot open his mouth to ask it to return and he should allow him to keep it for himself forever. So, based on what the seller, I made a mistake, based on what the buyer does, the seller should decide whether I should recognize the financial asset continuously or whether I should de-recognize. Now, market price is expected to be 9 million rupees after the sale and the put option is valid for 2 years time just for the example. And the buyer knows you need to look at from the buyer's perspective and then see what the seller should do whether he should de-recognize or not. If the buyer knows that the market price will be up and that will be 9 million rupees, if the buyer returns he gets only 7 million. So, might as well to keep it forever and to sell it to someone outside the market without returning and losing 2 million rupees. So, if you were the buyer, you would decide to return or you would decide to keep it, you would decide to keep it. Then the buyer will not exercise the put option. If the buyer exercises the put option, the asset goes back to the seller. Here, put option is out of the money. If the buyer does not return, that's like giving the benefit to the buyer, the risks and rewards have been transferred and then seller has to de-recognize the financial asset. And if the market price after the sale over two years time will be expected to rise to 12 million rupees. Getting this asset back to the seller from the buyer is like you getting blood out of a stone. You can't do that ever. And the buyer is very much unlikely of returning the asset back to the seller. So, the put option is deep out of the money. Deep out of the money. And seller should be recognized. And if the market prices are expected to fall down to 5 million rupees after the sale, then the buyer has to think wise. If the asset is returned, he gets 7 million rupees. If he keeps and sells to someone outside, he gets only 5 million rupees and to suffer a loss of 2 million. So, might as well to return rather than to keep and to suffer. So, then the buyer will decide to return it. And then the buyer is likely of returning by exercising the put option, then the put option is in the money. And if the buyer is returning that the seller has to get it back, now the value is 5 million rupees at the time of repurchasing and he has to refund, seller has to refund 7 million rupees now, the loss is to the seller, loss is a risk risk is still with the seller. So, the seller cannot de-recognize, do not de-recognize. And if the market prices will be falling down to absurd levels like 1 million rupees, put option is deep in the money and do not de-recognize.
So, this is how a put option works and this is how you should decide whether you should derecognize or not when there is a put option. So, lot of instances are given repurchase agreements for securities lending assets that are substantially the same, repurchase agreements securities lending right of substitution, repurchase rights of first refusal at fair value, wash sale transaction, put options and call options that are deeply in the money and cash settled call or put options, clean up calls, removal of accounts, provisions, subordinated retained interest and credit guarantees, interest rate swap, total return swaps, all these are uh, part of our discussions, but we can't discuss due to the time constraint and we will go forward. We will also derecognize a financial asset when the entity loses the control of the asset. Now, let me take the same put option to explain. Say exercise price is 7 million rupees and the buyer has been given the put option. Market price is expected to be 10 million rupees after the sale. And if the buyer decides to return it, he gets only 7 million rupees, but if he decides to keep it for himself and to sell it to someone outside, he will get 10 million rupees. Then the entity has lost the control. Why? The entity can keep insisting to return it back however much the seller insists. That's like you ask him for the sun and the moon, you will never get it back. Why? The buyer is the person who has been given the decision making power and if you have lost the decision making power meaning you have lost the control over the asset. If you have lost the control over the asset, you have no option but to derecognize it. So, here you derecognize it here, the put option is out of the money, out of the money, you decide to derecognize it not only because we have transferred risks and rewards to the buyer, also you have transferred the control to the buyer. And last one under derecognition. You derecognize financial assets where liabilities are incurred. Say we have a fixed deposit of 10 million rupees, a simple example. We are in company A, company B wanted a bank loan. Company B has been notorious in defaulting loans to almost all the banks even including the blood bank. And then B has taken a bank loan of 10 million rupees from bank C and company A has given their fixed deposits as a collateral to the bank of company B. As usual and expected, company B has defaulted the loan and the bank is not losing anything because they will recover the loan by possessing the deposits of company A. Now, the 10 million bank loan liability is falling on the fixed deposit of company A where liabilities occur on financial assets, you need to derecognize this 10 million worth of a deposit is no longer A's deposits and that is uh, the bank of company B's deposits and you need to forget about it and to derecognize it from the books of A. So, that is how you do the derecognitions. It was just a small explanations and there are so many areas to be looked into, but due to the time constraint, we will limit that examples to those. And then we will go to another important area, C 
say impairment of financial assets. So, we are moving on to impairment of financial assets. And LKS 36 of impairment has got nothing to do with the financial assets impairment. LKS 36 deals with the impairment of non-financial assets. Financial assets impairment is dealt by SLFRS 9. Now, if you have done LKS 39 before, the main reason why a revision was required for LKS 39 is because there were a lot of deficiencies in impairment model. The impairment model we had developed was incurred loss model. You get to know that the asset is impaired only when everything is done. You get to know the asset is impaired only when the impairment is done, impairment has occurred. And we had lot of concerns about the fact it does not provide forward looking information coming events cast their shadows before. If somebody comes to the classes, start drowsy, starts being drowsy, starts being sleepy, start playing with the fingers, start playing with the nails, start playing with the hair and starts coming late, starts leaving early and those are indications of possible impairments of the results at the exam. Why? Forward look, we need to tell them, look here, you coming late will impair your results at the exam, you leaving early of the class will impair your results at the exam, you being drowsy in the class will impair your results at the exam. And <coughs> me telling to a student that you fail the exam because of sleeping in the class is incurred loss model. She or he themselves know that they have failed and no point of me saying that, telling them that they have failed and they themselves know. But before that fail, I should tell them look here if you do not change the way you are in the class, if you stop being drowsy, if you stop being uh, inactive, if you stop leaving early, if you stop coming late, then you can correct yourself and then you have better results at the exam. So, this <coughs> shifting from LKS 39 to SLFRS 9 was required the most because we wanted to incorporate more forward looking information into the impairment model without having this incurred loss model. So, that, that was all about it. It is so much for the introduction of impairment model of SLFRS 9 and this area is 3, 4 times bigger than all the areas we have learnt in SLFRS 9 LKS 32 that, that needs lot of time to discuss. Also what I do here in this video will not be a comprehensive one. When you do this practically it is much more harder. So, you can't do anything in practice with this little knowledge you need to expand your circumference of your knowledge of impairment to apply that in practice. So, the model that we apply is called credit loss model, credit loss model, credit loss model. What is it? The expected shortfall in contractual cash flows, expected shortfall in contractual cash flows. Then expect credit losses, the weighted average of credit losses with the respective risks of a default occurring as they as they weights. So, if you apply the probability weightage for the shortfall of contractual cash flows in the future that is called the expected credit losses. Lifetime expected credit losses, the expected credit losses that result from all possible default events over the expected life of financial instrument. Then past due a financial asset is past due when a counterparty has failed to make payment when that payment was contractually due. 
purchase or originated credit impaired financial asset purchase to originated financial assets that are credit impairment on initial recognition. So, we will take one by one in our discussion. Right. In applying this credit loss model, uh, if you take that on weighted average with the weighted probabilities, we call it uh, expected credit loss. Credit loss is the expected shortfall in the cash flows in the future. Expected credit loss will be the probability weighted of shortfall of cash flows in the future. Now, when you apply this credit loss model, also you can't help talking about possible default events in the future. You can't help talking about possible default events. Possible default events. How possible is a financial asset being defaulted? Default event, possible default events. Now, as you can see for yourself now, when you apply the impairment model, all the financial assets are taken to three stages. Stage 1, we call it a financial asset, where there is no significant deterioration in credit risk. There is no significant deterioration of credit risk from the initial recognition. And what do you mean by a significant deterioration of the credit risk, credit quality, lot of indications, lot of examples are there. And the simplest example that anybody can take ever is a financial asset or receivable balance being passed due. due. What do you mean by a receivable being a past due if a particular receivable is more than 30 days due from the due date, we call it a past due. And there is a rebuttable presumption on that. Let me restrict our examples only for this one, if not it becomes a lengthy discussion. If a particular financial asset has not become past due and that is considered to be a financial asset of which credit quality has not significantly deteriorated, then you put it under stage 1. Just for a simple example, and if you have granted a loan to a customer, at say 10 percent interest rate, uh, let me say 2 percent interest, uh, say 10 percent interest annually and you are supposed to receive the capital plus interest on 25th of each month and if this customer has been very good, has been a very good customer of making the payment exactly on 25th, not before 25th, not after 25th and he is as good as his words ever before to make the payment exactly on 25th of each month and the credit quality has not significantly deteriorated. So, there can be just ups and downs either way, just one or two day to one or two days delay or one or two days uh, early payment and that ups and downs either way does not say that the credit quality has significantly deteriorated. If that credit quality has not deteriorated significantly, we put it under stage number 1. Then, if the credit quality is deteriorating significantly, quality is decreasing, quality is going from bad to worse, quality is becoming poor 
and it is now becoming past due, it is outstanding balances are due for more than 30 days time, then the credit quality is deteriorating, it is declining gradually, quality is dropping, risk is increasing. When the quality drops, the risk is increasing, then that particular financial asset is no longer at stage 1 and that has to be kept at stage number 2. So, depending on which stage a particular financial asset is graded, your impairment review can be different. And stage 3, objective evidence as I have occurred triggering the fact that the financial asset is impaired. Objective evidences are becoming apparent to confirm, to guarantee that the financial asset is impaired. And now, lot of indications are given for objective evidences. So, let me explain you some of the objective evidences. If the customer becomes bankrupt, objective evidence, and if there are significant breach of loan covenants, objective evidence, say settlement has to be always on 25th of each month, that is the loan covenant. And this man has practiced or developed the habit of making the payments once in three months time the full amount and once in four months time the full amount and this man sometimes pays only the interest, no capital and that is what the breach of loan covenants and that is an indication of providing objective evidence, it is no longer at stage one or two, it is at stage number three, objective evidences are provided. And disappearance of an active market and requesting some concessions that would have been would not have been otherwise available to the customer. And the loan tenure has been 10 years, 2 years have gone, another 8 years is left out, and this man is asking another 5 years time, 8 plus another 5 altogether, another 13 years to make the full payment. And he says interest rate is 12 percent, he cannot afford to pay 12, he is asking us to bring down the rate from 12 percent to 6 percent. He is asking the concessions which are not otherwise would, which would not have been otherwise available to the customer if not the customer is bankrupt. A lot of indications can be there for objective evidences, if those objective evidences are available like being bankrupt and having significant financial difficulties, breach of loan covenants, disappearance from an active market. And those objective evidences will make us bring this financial asset to stage number 3. Then, <coughs> if you categorize the financial asset In the particular stages appropriate, let us see how we conduct the impairment review. Right. When a particular financial asset lies at stage 1, the credit loss model should be 12 months expected credit loss model. What does it say? You need to foresee 12 months ahead to see what the possible default events can be, reducing the future cash flows of the entire financial asset. 
and you need not to forecast the possible default events over the entire lifetime. You should forecast the possible default events only just one year ahead to see how possible the future cash flows of the asset being reduced over the entire lifetime as a result of a possible default event to happen just within 12 months time from the date of the impairment review. It is like this. So, there was a girl. She has been amazingly good at her studies in school, consistently good. She got 9 A's in O level, became island first, thought of doing commerce stream just for the purpose of being island first. She became island first in A levels as well. So, her quality has not deteriorated significantly. Consistent performances and her parents are not bothered about what event will bring down, reduce the potential of being island first in all the exams in charted. Her parents are bothered about what even can reduce her ability of being island first in only business level 1. She started doing chartered business level 1. So, they are reviewing only 6 months expected credit loss model because they are reviewing, they are <coughs> predicting the possible default events only 6 months ahead from the date of the studies of chartered right up to the exam date. Like what? She, there is nothing that can prevent her from being island first in the exam, the way she has been performing consistently ever in the history. But certain things will reduce her ability of being island first at first exam, like what? Now, just imagine she getting into a tri show asking the tri show driver to drop her at St. Lawrence and on her way she was concentrating and reading some notes. The tri show guy has taken the girl to St. Lawrence to see that it was St. Lawrence church not St. Lawrence college which was the exam center and she was in a panic now. She is losing her concentrations that will distract her and she got late by 30 minutes to the exam hall and that will bring her down and psychologically she is down and that will reduce her ability of being island first at exam happens. And she got into the bus to, do, to go to the exam hall. Now, she is getting down from the bus and the person who was behind this girl stepped on her sleeper and she stumbled and fell off from the bus and she was injured started bleeding and that she can't go to the exam on time and that will once again reduce her ability of bringing down uh, that will reduce her ability of being island first at the exam and it was hell of a rainy day heavy downpour of rain and she got caught to rain and she does not have an umbrella even once again she got caught and she was late to exam hall and that will bring down, that will reduce and impair her ability of being island first at the exam. And she was little absent minded and for all level A levels parents were arranging everything for her. But she was now living alone at a boarding place in Colombo. On the exam date, she rushed off to the exam center. She has forgotten to bring the admission paper that was let, left at home. Now, she is in a panic that will distract her and she could not perform the way she wanted to perform and that will impair her ability of being island first in the exam. So, likewise, however much a particular financial asset has been, Sometimes there can be certain default events that will bring down the ability of collecting the future cash flows. If the credit quality has not come down significantly, you should foresee predict those possible default events not for the entire lifetime of the financial asset. You need to look at only 
12 months ahead to foresee the possible default events that will bring down, that will impair the future cash flow. So, we call it 12 months expected credit loss model. Stage number 2, <coughs> where the credit quality has deteriorated significantly, you just foreseeing, you just predicting possible default events only over 12 months time is not enough. You need to foresee the possible default events over the rest of the lifetime of the financial asset. If the financial asset has 5 years time, you need to evaluate the entire 5 years ahead to see what event will impair the ability of collecting our contractual ca cash flows over 5 years to come ahead. So, that is called what lifetime expected credit loss model. And this girl had strongly determined never to have a crush until she becomes a chartered accountant. And just within two months time after starting her chartered, she has fallen in love with a boy. And he started nagging her, started whining at her, she, he started calling at her, she started, he started dating and all those nonsense are occurring now. She is more concerned about the crush and the romance, not on studies now. Now, credit quality has deteriorated significantly. Now, the parents are predicting the possible default events throughout the lifetime. What and what event over the rest of the lifetime will damage her life, will bring and impair and reduce her ability of being island first at all the exams are hit. That is to lifetime expected credit loss model. And if there are objective to evidence is the worst case, once again you need to see possible default events over the entire lifetime. If you have invested in a bond of a company and this has remaining 10 years lifetime for the maturity once again like in stage number 2, you should foresee possible default events over the rest of the entire 10 years lifetime to understand, to realize what and what future events, default events will reduce our ability of being able to collect our contractual cash flows. So, even for the financial assets at stage number 3, you need to perform lifetime expected credit loss model. Then, coming back to stage number 1. If the credit quality has not deteriorated significantly, for an example, it has not become past due, it is only 12 months expected credit loss model. And if you work out impairment loss, impairment loss is recognized into an allowance account. Allowance account is shown as a deduction from the asset account. Now, if the asset is 1 million, if the allowance is just 1000 rupees without you crediting that to asset account itself, you will credit that only to the allowance account. And interest, effective interest being recognized should be based on gross amount, not on net amount. Say if the interest rate is 10 percent effective rate, still even after recognizing impairment loss, you continue to apply 10 percent on gross carried value of 1 million. And if you apply lifetime expected credit loss model for a financial asset at stage number 2, still you recognize impairment loss into a separate allowance account as you present it in the balance sheet that is shown as a deduction from the asset. Asset value is 1 million, allowance is 2000 and the allowance account is shown as a deduction from the gross value in the balance sheet. And even for a financial asset that is at stage number 2, even after recognizing impairment loss, 
your interest recognition afterwards should be based on the gross carrying value of 1 million, not on the net value. And stage number 3, if the impairment loss is say 5000 for a financial asset at stage number 3, still you recognize the impairment loss to a separate allowance account that is shown as a deduction from the asset value in the balance sheet. But the way you recognize interest now is difference, different. How will you recognize interest for a financial asset which is at stage number 3? You recognize interest not on gross carrying value at the net carrying value net carrying value. Right. And then let me explain the kinds of financial assets that need impairment reviews, that need impairment reviews. So, as now I said <coughs> in our previous videos, globally, if you categorize financial instruments, there can be only three derivatives, investments in equity instruments, investments in debt instruments. Derivatives will fall under only in this category fair value through profit and loss. Investments in equity instruments will be either under fair value through profit and loss if it is for trading. If it is not for trading, it is under fair value through OCI. If it is investments in ordinary shares, irrevocable election. Investments in debt instruments, if it is for trading, fair value through profit and loss. If it is with both objectives of collecting contractual cash flows and sales proceeds, put it under fair value through OCI. If it is solely for the purpose of collecting principles and interest contractual cash to put it under uh, amortized cost category. And as far as 9 says, derivatives need not to be, need not to be tested for impairment. Need not to be tested for impairment. Then again, investments in equity instruments need not to be tested for impairment, need not to be tested impairment. 
so there are reasons but if you start if I start explaining the reasons that will take a long time. Then again here debt instruments anything that is categorized under fair value through profit and loss need not to be reviewed for impairment need not impairment. So, these entire anything that is categorized under fair value through profit and loss need not to be reviewed. Derivatives on the other hand need not to be tested for impairment and equity instruments need not to be tested for impairment and debt instruments classified under fair value through profit and loss need not to be tested for impairment. So, then you need to test only debt instruments investments for impairment classified even either under fair value through OCI or fair uh, measured at amortized cost. Debt instruments either classified under fair value through OCI or measured at amortized cost. In addition to those, we will test lease receivables for impairment, lease receivables recognized under SLFRA 16. Apart from those also we will recognize or we will review for impairment, we will review contract assets recognized under SLFRA 15. So, basically four debt instruments, investments in debt instruments classified under fair value through OCI, investments in debt instruments measured at amortized cost and lease receivables recognized under SLFRS 16 and contract assets recognized under SLFRS 15 are the typical financial assets to be reviewed for impairments under SLFR is 9 impairment model. So, let me go to a simple example with the little knowledge we gathered. San Fran is a company that has issued a public bond. It reports to its shareholders on a biannual basis. TPLC, a company which holds financial assets until maturity, is one of many investors in San Fran's bond. On purchase, TPLC deemed the bond to have a low credit risk due to San Fran's strong capacity to fulfill its short term obligations. It was pursued the adverse changes in the economic environment could have a detrimental impact on San Fran's liquidity. At TPLC's reporting, it has access to the following information about San Fran. Sales have declined by 15 percent over the past six months. External agencies are reviewing its credit rating, but no changes have yet been made. Although market bond prices have remained static and France bond price has fallen dramatically required discuss the accounting treatment of the bond in TPLC's financial statements at the reporting date. Right. So, you need to see which stage this financial asset can lie. Stage 1 that requires 12 months expected credit loss. Stage 2 requiring lifetime expected credit loss because the credit quality has deteriorated significantly. Stage 3 that requires lifetime expected credit loss because objective evidences are there. At the beginning, it was not credit impaired, I will tell you what it is. Then on the reporting date, say Bond has been issued by San Fran, issuer, TPLC is the investor. San Fran is the issuer, right. So, it is like TPLC giving a loan to San Fran to recover it later. Now, 
TPLC should collect informations they need to have access to, informations of San Fran to decide which impairment model should apply for the investment of TPLC. Now, TPLC has in access to the information of San Fran. Sales of San Fran have declined by 15 percent over 6 months period, decline of sales over 6 months period. External agencies are reviewing its credit rating, but no changes have yet been made. External agencies, you know what external agencies are like, pitch rating, pitch rating, they have not changed their rating. Although market bond prices have remained static, the bond prices of San Fran has fallen dramatically. Their bond prices have fallen. So, there are two indications. Sales being lower by 15 percent over 6 months at a stretch and then when the bond prices of all the other entities are static in the market, exceptionally the bond price of this particular company has fallen. So, that will awake your concerns about how possible the default event to, events to happen. So, now the credit quality has to be assessed credit quality of the bond has changed significant, significantly has not changed. So, taking these two factors into account, credit quality of the bond of San Fran's, San Fran has significantly deteriorated as a result. If the credit quality deteriorates significantly, the financial asset is no longer at stage 1 it has to be shifted to stage 2 that requires lifetime expected credit loss. Let us go to a small question now to calculate impairment losses. <coughs> On 1st January 18, NPLC purchased a bond for rupees 1 million rupees. So, let me open up the investment account. Balance 1 million. It is measured at amortized cost ok, interest of 10 percent is payable in areas, repayment is due on 30 by December 20, in 3 years time effective rate of interest is 10 percent. On 31st December 18, end of the first year, oh, this is where we are now, another 2 years more to go, it estimated that the probability of default on the bond within the next 12 months would be 0 0.5 percent probability default is 0.5 percent. We do that assessment here being at the end of the first year. NPLC estimated that if default occurs within the next 12 months, then NPLC estimated that no further interest will be received. So, then here 100,000 should be received, we do not get it if the default event occurs. Here 100,000 has to be received, we will not get it if the default occurs. And that only 50 percent of the capital will be repaid on 31st December 2020. Capital is 1 million, so we will not get that entire 1 million back and we are losing 50 percent, so that will be 500,000. So, those are the shortfall of future cash flows and what impairment review do we do here? This is where we are reporting that since the credit quality has not deteriorated significantly, we will implement, we will carry out 12 months expected credit loss model. So, you need to foresee 12 months ahead to identify possible default events within 12 months time and if that 
default event happens occurs within 12 months time how much of contractual cash flows of the asset will be lost then required to discuss accounting treatment of the financial assets so let's look at our impairment model now expected credit loss model is the probability weighted probability weighted so you need to apply 5 percent then only credit loss becomes expected credit loss model credit loss will be 100,000 and another 100,000 and 500,000 that is the credit loss for that to be the expected credit loss you need to apply probability weight that is 0.5 percent and then it becomes expected credit loss uh, model and then what you can do is you can apply two methods anyway we'll apply the simple method second year end we are losing 100,000 and you need to work out the present value remember to calculate the present value of the cash flows we are going to lose you need to apply original effective interest rate and that has to be noted read in your mind and then how much of a cash flow are we losing in the second year 100,000 this is to be discounted by 1.1 third year rent we are losing the third year interest plus 50 percent of the capital that will be in total 600,000 discounted by the effective interest rate original and then let us take the figures This has to be 90,909. This has to be 495,868. Altogether 586,777. Now, those are the cash flows. Credit loss is so much. For that to be the expected credit loss, you need to apply probability weight. What is the probability of V? losing this amount if that default event occurs within 12 months ahead if you have a hundred percent probability you need to recognize total amount as a impairment loss so what is the probability of we losing this amount it's only 0.5 percent so 0.5 percent is equal to 2933 point8 and that is what the provision should be created by allowance account is opened up allowance account is opened up so you can debit to profit and loss and credit to the allowance account by 2933.8 as you show these in the balance sheets so you show asset value 1 million financial asset minus the balance of the allowance account and the net amount is then shown thereafter. So, let us see another question. On 1st January 2017, EPLC made a 4 year loan of 10,000 rupees to F the coupon rate on the loan is 6 percent the same as the effective rate of interest interest is received at the end of each year on 1st january 20 f tells e that it is in significant financial difficulties at this time the current market interest rate is 8 percent he estimates that it will receive no more interest from f it also estimates that only 6000 of the capital will be repaid on the redemption date. He has already recognized a loss allowance of 1000 in respect of its loan to F required to show the account. 
now here we apply the credit loss model and what is the length of the lifetime of the financial asset 4 years started the loan has been granted on 1st January 17 we are now on 1st January 20 see how many years gone 3 years gone just only 1 year is left. So, we are at the beginning of the last year of the lifetime of the financial asset. What is the interest to be received? coupon and effective rates are similar. So, we should receive 6 percent interest, 6 percent interest will be 600. So, we are going to lose it due to the difficulties, financial difficulties of the borrower, we are going to lose interest and also we are going to lose 6000, it also says that only 6000 of the capital will be repaid. So, we are going to lose 4000 from the capital total will be how much 4600, 4600. 4600 should be discounted using the original effective interest rate 1.06, 1.06 let us work it out. 4600 divided by 1.06 that is 4339. 4339. So, that is what we are going to lose. The probability default is not given. So, let us assume that to be 100 percent. So, we need to create a provision by 4339 allowance for impairment since already we have recognized 1000 and the balance is the amount to be provided for that is 3339 that goes to profit and loss. Closing balance should be 4339 as you show the investment financial asset and allowance account financial asset has a carry in value of how much 10,000 amortized cost is 10,000 minus allowance allowance has to be 4,339 and the balance e is now appearing in the balance sheet. <clears throat> Amount of impairment loss. Is equal to probability default into exposure at default into loan given default and this is important and this is what you do in practice practice. The amount of impairment loss to be recognized should be the coefficient of probability default exposure at default and loan given default. What do you mean by probability default? As we did in the first example, if the credit quality has not deteriorated significantly, we apply 12 months expected credit loss to see how probable default events to occur within 12 months time from the reporting date reducing the cash flows of the entity over the, reducing the cash flows of the financial asset over the rest of the lifetime. And if the probability of that default is 100 percent and if you feel that we are losing 533,333 amount of cash flows, the 
the cash flows that are to be lost in the future will be multiplied by 100 percent probability default. It is as clear as crystal that particular event happens within 12 months time and the entire cash flows will be lost 100 percent probability. So, you need to assess the probability of the default event. Exposure at default. Now, this is where the problem is. This is where certain banks are finding difficult in recognizing impairment losses. Why? So, there can be revolving facilities for certain clients, like what bank code is like a revolving facility. Now, if the OD facility granted is 10 million and already if the client has drawn only 4 million rupees, you should assess what the maximum exposure of the bank OD can be in the future. In the sense Although the client has drawn only 4 million rupees, for the moment the bank has to receive only 4 million rupees from the client by now, but in the future the client has a full potential of going up to a maximum amount of 8 million rupees within the given limit. So, your receivable balance is only just 4 million, but you need to apply impairment model not for 4 million rupees, you need to apply it for 8 million rupees. That is the expected full optimistic exposure in the future. So, then sometimes receivable balance is only just 4 million rupees, but your impairment allowance can be 5 million rupees. Why? you apply impairment model not on the outstanding balance, on the full potential of the maximum exposure. I hope that was, that you all got that point well, exposure at default. And then, <coughs> loan given default, say for a small example, if an entity has 1 million loan granted, receivable balance is 1 million, probability default is only 5 percent and we are going to, I mean we will feel that we will lose entire 1 million capital. What is the probability of the event occurring? Probability is only 5 percent. Before that, we will forget about exposure at default for the moment, loan given default. Now, this customer has given us a land as a security and the land has a fair value of 800,000 rupees. So, even if the customer does not pay the entire 1 million, the lender, the bank does not lose the entire 1 million rupees because the lender can sell the land at 800,000 rupees in the market and recover 800,000. So, how much will the bank lose maximum? Only 200. Then future cash flows to be lost is 1 million, but loan given default is only just 20 percent. So, you apply 1 million into 20 percent loan given default is that. So, we will lose only 200,000. What is the probability of that default event occurring within 12 months time 5 percent? So, then that will be just 1000 provision. The required provision will be 1000. So, as a result, for you to arrive at the final amount of impairment loss, it has to be the coefficient of probability default, exposure at default and loan given default. So, what is the hardest part to do to calculate here? It is not the exposure default, it is not the loan given default, 
the hardest part will be probability default and that is the hardest part. So, let me work out a simple example on that and then to finish our discussion on impairment. This is not a full coaching, but it will do a lot at the exam. Say total sales, 10,000 of a particular period, bad debts, 300, right. And I must explain this part as well. Credit losses are the present value of cash shortfalls. Yes, we studied that. Expected credit losses are an estimate of credit losses over the life of the financial instrument. An entity should consider the following when measuring expected credit losses. Probability weighted outcome, time value of money, reasonable and supportable information. Uh, probability weighted, I am going to discuss it now. Time value of money is included in the discounting rate. Say, <coughs> let me prepare a small table. Total sales 10,000. Then total paid. 10 aging profile and this is what we normally have in businesses this is not something new but this has to be modified paid in 30 days 2000 total paid 2000 8000 paid between 30 and 60 days 3500 then total payments are 5500 Aging is 4005, so that is what is to be recovered after 60 days. Paid between 60 and 90 days, 8500. And this is 1005. Paid after 90 days. One thousand two hundred. Total payments nine thousand seven. Aging is three hundred. let me bring the same facts into the format that we are familiar with and the format that we have we have accustomed to this is what we have seen in almost all business enterprises the common figure 300. So, you can work out the percentage. Percentage here 3 percent, here 3.75 percent, 
here 6.67 percent, 6.67 percent, here 20 percent, 20 percent. And this is the pattern of you losing based on the past experience. And these calculations are purely based on past experience, past, this is what we have been experiencing. This is something similar to incurred loss method. So, we calculated, established this pattern and the percentage of losses based on what we have lost, incurred loss method. So, you need to take into account past experience present conditions and the future expectations as well into this expected loss method. So, these percentages need to be further developed, further modified by taking the current conditions and future expectations. For a simple example, based on the pattern of rising unemployment in the future, your probability default will be high based on the expected rise in inflations in the country, probability default will be high. Based on the depreciation of the currency against US dollars, your probability default will be high. So, there will be quantitative plus qualitative information to be incorporated. When you do it in practice, it is going to be hell of a difficult task and it is going to be holistic evaluation. So, by predicting future unemployment, by predicting future inflation, I am taking just few items only, by predicting future depreciation of currencies in the future, these default rates need to be further modified. That has to be done in practice, but let me take some arbitrary figures. Just imagine this rising from 3 percent to 4 percent after bringing forward looking information based on expected rise in unemployment, based on expected rise in inflations in the future, based on depreciation of currencies in the future, based on increase in interest rates in the future. We expect the 3 percent to go up to 4 percent. Now, we have incorporated past information that is 3 percent and that was modified to 4 percent by incorporating current conditions and future informations by loading as much future forward looking information as required. And this will be moving towards to 5 percent, I have taken arbitrary figures and this has moved up to 8.9 percent and this is 27 percent. These are the modified percentages of probability default, probability default. Then just imagine your debtors been, debtors been 50,000 rupees, current figure 20,000. After 30 days, it is uh, 10,000 and this is 9,000, this is 11,000, then 20,000 into 4 percent, 10,000 into 5 percent, 9,000 into 8.9, 11,000 into 27 percent. So, 20,000 into 4 percent is 800, 10,000 into 0 0.5 percent is 500, 9,000 into 8.9 percent, 801, 11,000 into 27 percent, 2,970, total is how 2,970 plus 801, plus 500, plus 800, total impairment loss will be 
5071 if you forget about loan given default exposure at default only just by applying probability default your total impairment loss will be 5071. Then just two points to uh, tell you. For trade receivables, we have two approaches, simplified approach and general approach. General approach means the approach we have discussed now taking the financial assets to three stages, stage 1, 2, 3 depending on the credit quality and their deterioration. Simplified approach is without just evaluating the possible default events for 12 months and lifetime, once and for all we start evaluating possible default events for the entire lifetime, entire lifetime. But for you to apply that simplified approach, there is a requirement. What is the requirement? Make sure it is a financial asset that does not include a significant finance component. Make sure for you to apply the simplified approach, it is a financial asset or trade receivable that does not include a significant does not include does not include significant finance component if it is including significant finance component again you need to apply general approach that is taking to stage 1 2 and 3 uh, 12 months expected lifetime and so on and so forth if it does not include an interest component say for example we sell goods at 1000 and this is the invoice value and this is to be collected just in two months time at 1 million it does not include any significant finance component no interest then we can apply simplified approach but having sold goods today we are going to collect that in one year's time at 1.1 million rupees and this is including not only the invoice price also a significant finance component and then you can't apply simplified approach apply the general approach then the finally Purchased or originated, originated credit impaired financial asset. Say company A makes an investment to acquire a bond of a company that is company B and right at the time of buying the investment company B is bankrupt. Company B is not in a position to pay interest and capital. So this is called what purchased to originated credit impaired financial asset. So here what you must do is you need to account for this investment using credit adjusted credit adjusted effective interest rate credit adjusted effective interest rate as you decide the effective interest rate that is IRR calculations you must include the possible defaults as well 
So, that is so much for impairment model. It is only just that we covered small areas for the exam purposes. This is not enough at all for your practice and you need to learn different models, different entities have developed different models for impairment. And once again, we appreciate your contributions to watch our videos. Bye.